As many of you know, because I've talked about it a lot over the years, I really have always been a huge fan of the Survivor Series pay-per-view concept. You know, being an old school cat like myself, it was the second of the big four pay-per-views to come to be. And while I love the Royal Rumble pay-per-view in large part because of the Royal Rumble match, um, and SummerSlam could be its own special deal because you can get some WrestleMania-type stuff in the middle of the summer, Survivor Series was always that different animal. You know, while Royal Rumble had the Rumble match, you still had, you know, the traditional type of matches. SummerSlam, same type of deal. But Survivor Series was different. You know, that's where you would get largely team versus team. Heels versus faces. Or sometimes you would have faces and heels on the same team. It would be a great way to see people touch that had never touched before. It would be a great way to start off on angles heading towards WrestleMania. I, I miss the old days of Survivor Series. I used to love that show because it just had a different feeling. You know, the defending of the titles was secondary in a lot of cases to the Survivor Series matches. You know, and you, you could take a small thing and make it a huge thing, or you just put a bunch of people together for the fuck all of it and let the craziness of the frickin' pre-tape promos take place. Oh, man. Go back and watch some of those old Survivor Series uh, pre-tape interview segments from the first few years of it, especially like 89, 90, 91. Oh, fucking classic, dude. I love Survivor Series. Now, I, I'm not going to go back and do another Survivor Series review series, already done that in the past. Um, I'm not going to sit there and talk a bunch more about uh, this upcoming Survivor Series because I just don't feel like it. Um, <clears throat> so I'm like, what else can I do to talk about and profess my love about Survivor Series? And I'm like, what the hell? You know, people like me doing booking videos. I don't really do them anymore. I'm like, I'll give a quasi-booking video here. What the F? I'll do an all-time Survivor Series call. So here it is, and you can see the card in the description box down below. It feels, in some ways, like an old-school Survivor Series. Every match is this team versus this team. You've got, <clears throat> excuse me, a Heroes versus Villains match, WWF versus NWA, a women's match, U.S. versus the World, a match with tag teams, and then you've got the main event, which I will talk about quite a bit here in a few moments. You know, I was just sitting there, I was thinking about it, and, you know, just the possibility I'm throwing names up against the dartboard and hoping they stick, and I start to piece together these some of these matches and the names that I would put in there, and I was like, holy shit, man. man this would be awesome. <laughs> like, completely, totally, epically freaking awesome if this ever actually happened. Of course, it never did. That's why it lives in the world of fantasy, but fantasy can be fun, too, so what the hell. All right, so let me talk about this card. I'll talk about some matches more than others. This is the way it's going to be. Heroes versus Villains. I was trying to think of a team of really over baby faces over the years against a team of really, really quality heels from over the years. You know, for this show, I didn't want Mamby Pamby small names. I wanted as many big, huge, massive names as I could possibly acquire. Now, sometimes... I structured an individual team in a certain way because I'm like, well, this match has this person, this person, this person. You probably need somebody that can actually bump and do some stuff and work in that way and has the flexibility to work off of a variety of different people. And I'll talk about that a little bit in the WWF versus NWA match. But heroes versus villains, you know, I, I looked and I'm like, who could I think of over the years? In terms of great heroes. And there's a lot that got left off. And there, because there's only six matches and only so many spots, there's a lot of great names from over the years <clears throat> Excuse me, that were left off the card. You know, and even heroes versus villains. I went Ultimate Warrior, Junkyard Dog, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat, Vern Gagne, and Eddie Guerrero. I could have very easily, for me, you know, a, a, a one that I would have loved to put on the babyface team, the heroes team, might have been somebody like Wahoo McDaniel. But I was like, I want to get some type of representation um, from Mexico. And Eddie Guerrero was it here. I mean, look at that team, though. Ultimate Warrior. You know, he was a big star. Even with all the revisionist history that people want to have, you know, and what the Hogan's and the Vince's have tried to sell, and other people in the business that were jealous of Warrior spotting the money Warrior made, 
I was a kid at that time. Hogan is my favorite wrestler of all time. But for about a two-year stretch, The Ultimate Warrior was my favorite wrestler. And I'll never hide from that. And I'll never shy away from that. And I'm not afraid to admit that. And I'm not, by any means, the only person that grew up during that time that gravitated for a period of time away from Hulk Hogan and towards the Ultimate Warrior. So it pisses me off when I hear people try to do this revisionist bullshit. JYD, one of my favorites from my childhood. I was a bad dude, and he was so much fun. He had personality and charisma out the ass. God. I just wish he was given... And, you know, outside of Mid-South, obviously, where Bill Watts did good things with him. <clears throat> I really, truly wish that he had his stuff together enough and the wrestling business was a different place in a different time where he could have gotten a, a run at the real top and been a world champion because that would have been something to see. You know, but Ricky Steamboat, when you think of pure-blooded, all-American baby faces, it doesn't get much better than that. Just a phenomenal in-ring talent. Vern Gagne, again. You know, we talk about the AWA and all of his contributions there. But you talk about him as a wrestler on the DuPont Network that eventually became WGN in the 50s and the 60s. You know, there was a period of time where Vern Gagne was one of the most recognizable names in all of sports in this country. Not in wrestling, in all of sports. And people that grew up in that era, you know, they know Vern Gagne. You know, and he was a very successful promoter for a long period of time. Had such a positive influence on so many individuals' careers. You know, you could go through the laundry list of people that made stops there that were better because they made stops there. Superstar Billy Graham and Hulk Hogan and, you know, the Ric Flairs and the Dusty Rhodeses. And, I mean, I could go on and on and on about all this contribution. So he, when you talk about heroes and good guys, you know, there's always a part to me about Vern, you know. And now, granted, I wasn't... I wasn't a, a, a male nurse or whatever trying to help him where he was going to kill me um, in a state of confusion with his Alzheimer's. But when we're talking about Vergani in all seriousness, we're talking about one of the biggest stars in the history of the business, one of the best wrestling minds in the history of the business, one of the best promoters in the wrestling business. He most certainly deserves a spot here. And I always really respected the fact that he was a guy that to his dying day tried to still stay in kayfabe and still tried to sell wrestling as real. You know, there's part of it that's like, oh, get over it, old man. But then on the flip side, there's a part of that where you really, really respect that. And you're like, man, I wish wrestling had a little bit more of that today. And I most certainly wish the wrestling business had a little bit more of Vern Gagne today. And then Eddie Guerrero, what more do I need to say? The villains team, gorgeous George, classy Freddy Blassie, Rowdy Roddy Piper, Buddy Rogers, Jerry Lawler. I mean, look at that list of heels. Gorgeous George, outside of Vince McMahon, maybe the biggest heel in the history of the professional wrestling business. Blassie, monster heel for many years. Roddy Roddy Piper, phenomenal heel. Buddy Rogers, same thing. The original, real nature boy. Jerry Lawler, you know, he deserves a spot here too. You know, some might put him, depending on if you have huge ties to Memphis wrestling, you might put him in the heroes category. But here, I worked him in as a villain because I thought he deserved that spot. You know, and <clears throat> for a lot of people that didn't follow rep Memphis wrestling back in the day or just know him as a commentator with Jim Ross or now just kind of as a commentator who uh, doesn't really seem to give a fuck, you know, Lawler, incredible mind for the business. Great worker, great mouth, you know, personality, charisma, he, he had it all other than the physique. But he didn't need the physique because he had everything else. And he made everything else matter. The WWF versus NWA match, you know, when you talk about big names, this match has as many big names as any match on this roster, including the main event. On the WWF team, you've got the living legend Bruno San Martino, Mr. Bob Backlund, Andre the Giant, Shawn Michaels, and Macho Man Randy Savage. And, you know, for the WWF standpoint, you look at Sean, he's a guy that never went to WCW. It's part of the reason why he's on this list for me. Also, the fact that when I look at <clears throat> some of the people from the NWA side, along with Macho Man, I'd expect Shawn Michaels to be able to put on the best in-ring performance with a lot of these guys. So he serves a role in this match. And then on the NWA side, look at these names. Ric Flair, Luthez, Harley Race, Terry Funk, and Jack Briscoe. I mean, those are some big legends in the history of the NWA. 
and you look at this match, like part of the thing to me that was always the genius about Survivor Series is you could put a five-on-five -five match together and launch several potential stories out of it heading towards WrestleMania, and you could do the same thing here. You could launch Bruno and Luthez in one direction. You could launch Harley Race and Andre the Giant in another direction. You could always launch Shawn Michaels against Ric Flair. You know, you can always do that. Um, you could sit there and do Mr. Bob Backlund versus Jack Briscoe. You could do um, Macho Man Randy Savage versus Terry Funk. Can you fucking imagine the possibilities of awesome? Especially if it was a Macho Man special, a Waffle House match. <laughs> Ah, that would be a lot of fun. The women's match, you know, I'll be honest, this was the match by far that I had the most trouble coming up with 10 names, but I ultimately did. I, I'm happy with the list. It is what it is. Uh, not much more I want to really say about it, honestly. Um, but it was striking. As it was striking as I was doing this entire card, uh, just how few modern names were in there in terms of current full-time active performers. There really, truly, I think, is only one. One. That's a sad indictment on the state of the wrestling business, or it's a sad indictment on me living in the past. Probably a little bit of both. Probably. The U.S. versus the World match. You've got Dusty Rhodes, Hacksaw Jim Duggan, John Cena, Mark Henry, and Kurt Angle taking on Bret Hart, The Iron Sheik, Yokozuna, Ivan Koloff, and Sergeant Slaughter. Now, a couple of things stand out to you. You say, why would Mark Henry be in this U.S. versus the World match? Mark Henry is a former uh, Olympian. It's Mark Henry. It's this channel. You know the fucking history. Don't be stupid. Now, it's interesting on the heel side. Some of you might say, well, Sergeant Slaughter. Yeah, the Iraqi turncoat. That's the type of Sergeant Slaughter. The anti-American Sergeant Slaughter. The heel Sergeant Slaughter. I always thought that was the best Sergeant Slaughter, frankly. Uh, some of you might look at this and say, where's Chris Jericho? How did you leave him off your list? And to which I would reply, you know, I can't put everybody in there. He was definitely in consideration. So now, surely, I'm going to end up on Chris Jericho's list. But it's funny, in this particular case, whereas I put Sergeant Slaughter on the world team, if anything, I would put Chris Jericho on the U.S. team. You know, I know he said, he'll sit there and say, I'm from Winnipeg, you idiot! But then I would sit there and have him talk about I was born in Canada, but he doesn't acknowledge that part of his citizenship history. He is a New Yorker through and through. Oh, what a dick heel he could be doing that. <laughs> and then he could put me on the list. Fuck it. Uh, the tag teams back. You know, it's the one thing that I really miss as much as anything else about professional wrestling today is that tag teams just aren't as prevalent. They just don't matter as much. They just aren't as good. There just aren't as many of them. There aren't as many interesting characters and stories involving tag team wrestling. Now, I grew up on tag team wrestling. A lot of people did. And we know what it can bring to the table on so many different levels. And you look at this match. The Road Warriors, Von Erichs, the Rock and Roll Express, the British Bulldogs, the Hardy Boys, taking on the Dudley Boys, the Fabulous Freebirds, the Midnight Express, the Fabulous Kangaroos, and Edge and Christian. I mean, there, there are so many great tag teams from over the years that I left off on this list. Because I can only put 10 teams in. It was just my personal preference of 10 teams, and that's what I put in there. You know, a special shout-out really quickly to the Fabulous Kangaroos, one of the best tag teams of all time, one of the most innovative tag teams of all time that nobody ever freaking talks about because they date back to the 50s and the 60s and the 70s primarily. And they had several different uh, incantations of them, or however the hell you want to uh, put it. But they were a phenomenal tag team. You know, with their fucking Aussie heel gimmick, the Fabulous Kangaroos. Are you kidding me? I was stunned when I looked at the WWE Hall of Fame page and saw that they weren't in there. I just always assumed that they were, maybe even dating back to the 90s, but they're not. At least I didn't see them. I could have missed it. I'm pretty sure they're not. I want to talk about oversights and glaring omissions. This is a tag team... That is a very glaring omission if they are indeed not in the WWE Hall of Fame. But look at that list, man. Road Warriors and Dudley Boys, you could launch them off into one of those woulda, coulda feuds. You know, I don't give a shit. It had been done for two-plus years down in Dallas at the Sportatorium for WCCW. I could always go back to doing Von Erichs versus the Freebirds. Could always go back to doing Rock and Roll Express versus the Midnight Express. Are you kidding me? I mean, Jesus. Do Hardy Boys versus Edge and Christian. The British Bulldogs versus the Kangaroos. 
just right there, that match, not only do I think the match would be epic and awesome in terms of the performers and the characters involved, but I could launch off five really interesting tag team feuds if I so fucking desired. So, I look at this, and it was a lot of fun just to think about all the big names and stars from wrestling over the years. But it got to the main event, and I'm like, what would the main event of the all-time Survivor Series have to be? And, you know, I've got a babyface versus a heel match. I've got a women's match, a tag team match, U.S. versus the world, WWF versus NWA. And they all belong, but it's like, what would the main event be? And at the end of the day, there was only one choice for a main event. It had to be the Monday Night Wars. You know, the Monday Night Wars impacted the business forever. The Monday Night Wars impacted the way the business looks at the business. The Monday Night Wars impacted the way fans look at the business. Why the hell do you think 15 years after the Monday Night Wars ended, we're still concerned with, as fans, with the damn rating that the show draws? You know, the, the show could draw a million viewers, but be epic and awesome, or draw five million viewers and be shit. But we use it as a way to justify why we watch the product or why our product is better than the other product. And that dates back again to the Monday Night Wars. So many things, the shattering of kayfabe, so many things can be pointed directly to the Monday Night Wars, ultimately the disastrous result of WCW and ECW going away. So it has to be the main event here. And in some ways, this is a way to try and get right from the bullshit, the crap, the abortion that was the invasion angle of 2001. As I've talked about before, if you were of a certain age, like I said, you know, currently if you're like early to mid, maybe late 20s, you probably love the attitude, or the not the attitude, or the invasion angle. You probably love so many things about it. There were surprise moments, surprise appearances, there were twists, there were turns, there were big splashy things, lots of crash TV elements in play. And, and it worked for you. I think for a lot of fans in my age demographic in their 30s or 40s, the invasion angle was a piece of shit. Because it was like we had been waiting for this crap to happen for years. Now we could finally get it. And this is the turd the WWE served up to us and expected us to pretend it was chocolate mousse. I mean, it was just terrible and bad on so many different levels. You basically had WCW come to the fight without 90% of their top stars. Why would you do that? You now it's like back in the day, the Bulls are going to sit there and be like, yeah, we've got Michael Jordan and we've got Scottie Pippen. But let's go take on Patrick Ewing and the New York Knicks. And let's, let's sit there, and instead of playing Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen in Game 7 of the Eastern Conference Finals, just as an example, we're going to trot out there Pete Myers. <sighs> baby. Oh, baby. Let me think about that. You know, I'm just saying. That's kind of what it felt like to me, is instead of getting the best, you got the rest. Uh, but here's my chance to get it right. I've got the ability to get everybody involved. And that's what I'm going to do. The Monday Night Wars for Team WWF. I've got Stone Cold Steve Austin, The Rock, The Undertaker, Triple H, and Mankind. Now, there's a big part of me that wanted to make this a six-man match and throw Vince McMahon in here. Because at the end of the day, when you think about who is the WWF slash WWE, it is Vincent Kennedy McMahon. And when you look at the power of the personality and the power of the performer and and the ability to get everything that he was involved with over, you know, Vince McMahon deserved to be on this list. Especially because in a lot of ways, I would have to kind of work the WWF as the heel team in this case. The best way it works as a heel team, for that one night at least, even with guys like Austin, The Rock, and Taker, and Mankind involved, is you have to have Vince there. But I ultimately decided against Vince being there. You know, But Stone Cold, The Rock, The Undertaker, Triple H, Mankind. You're talking about a who's who of the WWF during the Attitude Era. Arguably the five biggest stars, not Vince and K. McMahon, from that time frame. You know, special mention to guys like Kane and so on and so forth. But those are the five. If you're WWF at that time, who are the five guys that you're going to pick? You know, if we're pretending this is real. If we're pretending here. I'm picking Austin. I'm picking The Rock. I'm picking Taker. I'm picking Triple H. And I'm picking Mankind. And I'm going to battle. And if you're WCW... And you're rolling into this dogfight. Who the fuck are you going to pick? You going to pick Rob Van Dam from ECW? Eat shit. You're going to do this right. You're going to bring in the big names 
that were all the top guys during a hot period of professional wrestling when WCW was the best show in town during the Monday Night Wars. You're bringing all those dudes. You've got to have the NWO involved. You cannot do the Monday Night Wars without having the NWO. You've got to have Hulk Hogan, Kevin Nash, and Scott Hall. And then you've got to have Sting. Because for so many years, Sting was that dude. He was the steady. He was the constant. He was the franchise. And for so many years, frankly, the pay within the business was measured based off of Sting. Uh, you hear Verts for so many years, people like Kevin Ash and Scott Hall talk about, is it less than Sting money, Sting money, or more than Sting money? You know, but when you think about WCW, one of the first names that always pops to your head is Sting, and he's got to be there. And think about it. If, you're, if your livelihood was on the line, you know, from a wrestling standpoint, or you wanted revenge, are you going to go into a foxhole with somebody like a Rob Van Dam, or are you going to go to a fucking foxhole with Sting? And then the fifth guy has got to be Goldberg. Again, when we talk about certain people being diminished over the years, you know, Goldberg was a big deal back in WCW. Did he have the same drawing power as the NWO? No. But frankly, at that time in the entire business, who the fuck did? There weren't many. There weren't many. You know, but Goldberg was a draw. Goldberg was a star. And again, when you're rolling into a fight where you've got to face guys like Austin, The Rock, and Taker, I want Goldberg in my fucking corner. Are you kidding me? Now, think about this. Imagine if that, if everything would have aligned and Triple H wasn't hurt and the WWF wouldn't have screwed the fucking pooch. Imagine if this was the five-on-five five that you got to close out the invasion angle. I'd have WCW win, personally. That's just me. That's the ultimate fuck you to Vince and the WWE for all their years of burying all these fucking people, especially from WCW. Ha <laughs> ha, we won, we won. And let's still remind everybody, even at WrestleMania 31, by having Sting job to fucking Triple H. Here's where I get my revenge. WCW reigns supreme. Eat shit, bitches. What an awesome night this would be if you could ever put this type of card together. And in particular, that main event, it would be to me the main events of main events, and it would go down in the record books as being as such. But maybe it wasn't a lot of fun for you to listen to me talk about my all-time Survivor Series card. It is whatever. I thank you for hearing me talk about at least some of it, um, if not all of it. I, I, I just have to say, though, I had a lot of fun piecing this together. Maybe I'll do another booking video or two on the road to WrestleMania and put some real, real thought, effort, and energy to plan out stories for a couple of months. Maybe. You just don't know. See what it is. But you're welcome to share your thoughts about my all-time Survivor Series card. Share yours in the comment section, too. I want, might not respond to many of them or all of them, but if you put it in the comments for this particular video, I'm going to read it because I want to see what you guys would do. Let it go now. The flaming keyboard fingers of fun fucking fire are gonna start. I'm going to put Tatsumi Fujinami in the oh my god. Tanahashi has got to be there. And Daniel Bryan, because there's the best motherfucking wrestler in the world of all time ever. And he just has to. Is he a punk? Oh god. I opened up the can of worms. I deserve whatever the fuck I get in the comment section now. Thank you.